Great. So my name is Ihor Mikhachishan. I'm the executive director of UCC National, and I'm very delighted that you can join us for this week's uh, second week of our episodes on community conversations on COVID-19. Uh, this is a, a program brought to you by UCC National with the support of the Canadian Red Cross and the Government of Canada. And uh, last week, our topic was youth groups, and we learned a lot about what they've been doing and, and uh, a lot of interesting news. This week, we're talking to arts centers, which uh, is a broad term to include some of the wonderful institutions that we have uh, here in Canada. So I'll be introducing our guests. Uh, ask, asking them to tell us more about themselves and their institution. And then we're going to get into a, a short discussion. Our goal is to sort of have a half hour conversation, uh, which we'll learn about the great things they're doing, and we'll have an opportunity to hear about their plans for the fall. So first, I'm going to ask uh, Pan Olich uh, from Kumpf, uh, if you can introduce yourself a little bit. Uh, tell us more about Kumpf. Yes, uh, my name is Olek Lesiuk. I am Vice President of the Ukrainian Canadian Art Foundation. Um, Kumpf Gallery, <laughs> um, and uh, I represent this uh, cultural institution, uh, which is uh, it has 45 years now of its history, and uh, since 1975 we were in the business of art uh, uh, promotion, Ukrainian art promotion, and exhibiting artworks and selling artworks in North America, and one of the biggest collections of uh, Ukrainian art in uh, North America. Um, among other museums and others, we have a very large uh, collection of Ukrainian Canadian art. Fantastic. And, and Kumpf is in Toronto. And yes. from Edmonton, uh, we have Deb Stasiuk from uh, Aqua. And Deb, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and about Aqua? Well, I'm the president of the Alberta Council for the Ukrainian Arts. Um, Alberta Council for the Ukrainian Arts was started in 1987 as um, first a national initiative and carried through by our provincial Congress. So we're the cultural arm and we are uh, both arts and cultural based and we have a gallery, we have a boutique, an artist uh, store, and we also have a large exhibit space and workshop space where we run programming. Uh, for the artists, I see us somewhat as a, a bit of a chamber of commerce for the artists because we provide um, that opportunity and a venue for them to sell their artwork and we provide the promotion and all those services, exhibit opportunities and teaching opportunities. Um, the other large mandate of Aqua is the preservation and the promotion of Ukrainian arts. So be that folk art or be that contemporary art. Um, it's uh, 12 genres of the arts that we work with, and it's also um, any artist of Ukrainian heritage. So while the artwork they, they may produce is not what we would call traditionally Ukrainian folk art, um, they still are artists of Ukrainian heritage. So uh, everybody is lumped into that. So like I said, we also produce the um, magazine called Aquavite, the Ukrainian arts and cultural magazine is produced through our organization. Great, thanks Deb. And uh, finally, uh, an organization that I'm familiar with because I used to be on their board <laughs> in Winnipeg, uh, Osadadok and, and Hannah Picklick. So Hannah, tell us a little bit about Osadadok and about yourself. Sure, uh, I'm Hannah Picklick. I'm the executive assistant at Osadadok Ukrainian Cultural and Educational Center. And like you said, we're uh, based in Winnipeg, Manitoba. So last year we celebrated our 75th anniversary. Um, and we are a museum, a gallery, a boutique. Uh, we have a collection of fine art, of artifacts, a library. And then of course we do programming lectures uh, to get people involved hands-on with the culture. Great. So we use the term arts centers because I think what, what each of you do is, is just broader than just an art gallery or a, you know, an art boutique. So uh, it's, it's, a, it's a broad range. So we're going to get into our first question, which is uh, sort of what has been the impact of COVID? And I think sort of since March, probably, I think it was Friday the 13th of March that, um, that the word pandemic started to be used and that many government orders came down in terms of closures of schools and businesses, et cetera. So from you know, thinking about March uh, through to now, so spring and summer, uh, you know, let's start with Deb. What's been, what's been the impact uh, on Aqua in terms of your operations and, and how you've been dealing with it? 
Well, one of the great successes of Aqua is the number of people that come through our door and the number of people who participate in our events, our activities and our workshops. So of course that all came to a screeching halt. And you know we had to make some very immediate changes in that we had to close for business. Um, we didn't want to be reactionary, we wanted to be proactive. So, but very quickly we put, you know, uh, some very thoughtful considerations into how we would move forward and tasked our, our various standing committees who run our different departments to come up with creative ways to make that happen. It was important for us to continue to secure our operating funding through um, Alberta Foundation for the Arts and also through the Edmonton Arts Council that um, how we adapted and how we responded was creative. It needed to be out of the box and it couldn't be just the reactionary response that, um, you know, that, that a lot were, were following the, sa the same path, right? When they, they certainly were monitoring us, engaging us on uh, where we went with that to be able to offer the same level of service. Um, so uh, immediate effects, of course, this hit during Easter, which is the biggest time for all of us uh, during uh, in the Ukrainian community. So for Easter, for us, that was cancellation of our Easter market, all of our Easter workshops and spring workshops. Um, that was also the cancellation of a number. We run a program called Kava Club, which is uh, tours that people go on on tours and all of those tours had to be uh, canceled. We also had to uh, cancel our um, art exhibits, upcoming art exhibits. We have a new exhibit every month. And then uh, significant events like our home is where the art is, where we do the tours of individual homes and people buy their, you know, buy a, a ticket to go on these private tours of individual art collections. And our uh, big signature event of the annual Ukrainian Vintage Fair. So we have, you know, some of our biggest programs happen Easter until, um, you know, July, and all of that had to be um, stopped. Yeah. And so what did you do to adapt? Any, any kind of creative solutions that you guys came up with? Well, we think we were very creative. Um, so what we did was we had to, we, we took a breath and we sat back and we said, okay, what are we going to do? So um, with the Easter market, we went virtual. So what we did was we profiled all of our vendors online and encouraged people to go shop at those vendors through their stores. We uh, contacted the vendors and they offered delivery, curbside pickup, all of that. We also then very quickly got all of our all of our Easter supplies and everything we would sell for Easter online and people were able to shop online and then we we shipped items out and sometimes we did curbside drop-off we had curbside pickup so that accommodated that unfortunately we weren't ahead able to go ahead with any of our Cava Club tours we weren't able to go ahead with the vintage fair because it just fell into too many restrictions to have that vintage fair um, and the art, oh, and we also, of course, had our, um, the exhibit that was happening at the time, we put that online. So those were things that we could do in the immediate. And then we got very aggressive with online promotion, online advertising. We spent the time uh, completing our online store because we have over 4,000 pieces of inventory and over 122 artists. So it's a, it's a huge job when each catalog item takes about 30 minutes. So we said, hey, make, uh, make hay while the sun shines and we're going to uh, get this online, which we successfully managed to do with a wonderful team. Um, we revamped our website and we also um, expanded. So we're in 20, we, our location is 2,500 square feet. We've added on another 2,800 square feet. So that when we do a relaunch of Aqua and all our programming in the fall, we actually will now have a space large enough to be able to offer programming and still follow all the COVID guidelines and safe distancing. 
Um, for those of you who have been in our existing space, you know, everything is quite tight. It's like being in Baba's kitchen, right? Everybody's, you know, moving around and tight. And like Ukrainians, we have lots of stuff, so it's very full. So with this expansion now, it's going to allow us to be able to offer workshops again, offer exhibits, offer markets, because we will have the space that we need for the proper social distancing. The other big project that we did was we have an online directory of artists. So anybody can go in and search for an artist and or um, a folk art or a service or something and a big revamp and update of that. Well, that's, that's excellent. That's great to hear. So that, that obviously that was that space expansion planned before COVID probably. We had talked about it. Um, and this just gave us the opportunity. Um, it gave us an opportunity to, to be able to do that without, I mean, you know, the upside was we were able to do all of these big projects that you need to do when you've got a focused time, you can do that, right? Because it's hard, as we all know, to take some of these big projects with, you know, the phone calls and the traffic flow and all the activities that are going on, which of course you want to have. We were faced with this situation where now there was this void. So we said, okay, everything on the table that we've ever talked about, uh -huh. that if one day it was <laughs> quieted aqua, what would we do? And that's what we did. It sounds like you did all of it. There. <laughs> <laughs> we have a wonderful team, you know, exceptional board and just the best uh, staff ever. So it, it came together. Excellent. And so at the end of the day, um, we feel like we, we didn't waste any time. Right. Absolutely. So Hannah, I'm just going to turn to you next. Can you tell us, uh, also that, like how, how have you been coping? Uh, what have you been doing to adapt and uh, maybe some, some examples of some of the things you've, you've had to do that have been creative or, or unexpected? Sure. Yeah. So uh, we closed in March at the end of March and we worked from home for about the staff continued working from home um, for about a month and a half. And then in Manitoba, uh, Museums were actually part of the first phase, museums and galleries. So we were back in the office beginning of May. So we weren't actually away for too, too long. Um, and we tried to keep, keep momentum going on certain projects. But I guess there's a few aspects of Rosada Doc that are the main ones um, that were impacted. So of course, like Deb said, happened right during Easter. That's like the biggest time for anyone who has a Ukrainian boutique. Um, everyone's looking for piss and supplies. So unfortunately, we shut our doors to the boutique to the public, but we did, we were able to launch an online store um, where people could order their piss and supplies and then do a curbside pickup. So we weren't able to ship out to anyone, but um, we we're very thankful that community supported us in that. Um, we also had to cancel our programming. So all of our piss and co workshops were canceled, which was a big thing. Um, but of course, being at home, people are looking for activities to do. So we encouraged people to, of course, uh, participate in this Pisanka supply pickup. And then we posted a Pisanka tutorial for people to follow along at home and try and do what they could with their kids. And we, we had a great response of um, people remembering that they did it when they were children and hadn't done it for a long time. And then they were looking to get back into it. So that was a really a nice bonus hearing from people. Um, in terms of the exhibits, so we had two, ex we had uh, At the Front Line, which was from Mexico in our gallery, and then featuring our own collection on their fifth floor, Tradition to Modernity. So our, the exhibit from Mexico, of course, it was close to the public, but um, there was a lot of great opportunities that came from that. We launched a YouTube channel where the curators of the exhibit were able to interview uh, many of the artists from Ukraine. And so we were able to post those on YouTube and people were able to get that extra glimpse into the exhibit that like, I guess they usually wouldn't have gotten if we didn't have this time to launch that. And then we also did a virtual tour of that exhibit, um, which is still handy now because people can just walk through on their phone if they want to socially distance or which we are encouraging and they can go through the exhibit and get a, get a inside look with the curators as they describe everything. And then with the collections, um, we stopped accepting donations for a while. We ex stopped accepting them for about two months. And then once we started again, because everyone was cleaning out their homes and they wanted to donate to us, which we're very uh, thankful for, 
but we did quarantine um, donations. We quarantined them for two weeks uh, before accessioning them. Um, yeah, and then just like Deb said as well, kind of things that are on the back burner, things that you wish you had time for all the time. Um, just because of the traffic and the guests that are always coming through, you don't have time for it, usually during the year. So it was almost like, I guess you could say a blessing in disguise for some of these mm -hmm. opportunities that have arisen where like many cleaning out our basement and rehoming some things into other parts of the building, being strategic with space because it's like Baba's kitchen in here as well. Uh, so yeah, it's been really nice. And then um, a, a big part of our operations is of course the people. Um, so a huge part of what Seraduk is the volunteers and um, we've been trying to keep, keep in touch with them. Many of them are helping with small projects around here where they can. And then those who aren't, we're just trying to give them a call, keep them involved, let them know that we care. Uh, we miss them. We can't wait for things to kind of go back to the usual. Um, yeah. Great. Excellent. And Pana Olek, tell us about Kumf. I know you guys were doing some interesting things, but what was the impact uh, in March? And then uh, how have you adapted to, to COVID? Yes, uh, normally <laughs> this period of time, we usually have a very basic uh, schedule. We, uh, every three weeks, we have uh, another exhibition of artists run exhibitions, and we have uh, uh, live concerts at the gallery. We have uh, presentations of books, lectures on art, and we, have, uh, we run um, uh, art school for children. Uh, artist art palette, and we, we, we all, you know, always uh, excited about the events and everybody is coming here and uh, enjoying the, uh, the program that we offer and uh, all the events that we create here and the um, uh, public is very excited about this. Of course, like for everyone else, it was a shock and uh, cultural shock for us and the financial and we have to close uh, our gallery as well, like everybody else. And um, of course, it has a deep impact on us, and we have to close all our events. Uh, we postponed our three uh, beautiful shows that we expected, like a solo show by Pablo Lapata, uh, his icon, 75 icons, uh, he was 75th anniversary, uh, so things now for Manco's uh, anniversary's uh, personal show. And um, treasures from the private collections of uh, members of Kulf, which is very popular. Usually, every annually we have this uh, uh, this show, and everybody is um, extremely uh, waiting and excited about this show. And because we we show the best uh, of like cultural museum quality artwork for sale, so. We, unfortunately, we had to postpone for the next year. I hope we will have this still in the gallery. But of course, uh, all this uh, had a great financial impact on us. But as everybody else, we had to be creative and uh, we have to, uh, to tell people that we're still alive. We're not, <laughs> you know, disappeared. And um, so we did uh, um, a series of online um, concerts. Uh, instead of live concerts like we had before, we every Sunday we, we run a virtual concert from the best of the best uh, musicians, uh, singers, composers from Canada, from US, from uh, Europe and Ukraine. And uh, those concerts were very, very popular. And, uh, that was uh, uh, exciting uh, for everyone and uh, they attracted a lot of new members and uh, uh, followers of our gallery. So. Even Excellent. on Facebook, we, we saw how many followers we have, much more than we had before. So it uh, did it really um, impacted on our cultural life, even at that quarantine time. Um, also, recently in, Ju in June, we started the uh, Artist Talks series. And the first one was, the, was very interesting with the organizers of um, Immersive uh, Van Gogh exhibit, which runs now in Toronto. So they... Um, they um, they talked about this show. About this is an incredible show. If you can see it, it's absolutely something uh, blowing mind uh, show, which uh, is absolutely new to our public public. So uh, that was uh, and 
it's actually created our ideas for something else so that we as a cook gallery at the foundation we can create our own shows like that based on the ukrainian canadian art and artists well, artists so we have already some ideas to, to create also uh i'm using this um, interaction in the our active uh, exhibition life we uh, we tried because this is our 45th anniversary uh, year we started in October celebrating will be probably, of course, we, we were uh, having plans to have some banquet or some presentation, but of course it has slightly to change because of that uh, limitation of public, we cannot afford now so many people. Uh, uh, so we, we uh, being creative, we're doing something with our collection. We're now digitizing uh, our collection, the best of the best from our collection. We have uh, more than 800 uh, artwork in, uh, of uh, uh, paintings, sculpture, graphics, and um, applied art. So we have uh, a lot of interesting work that we can show to public. We can present in the way of contemporary uh, presentation, something like Van Gogh or something like that. You know, so we are very in, in, uh, looking forward to, to that uh, project, and uh, that's how we, we use this situation right now to. Um, you know, to create something new that we can afford nowadays without uh, entering the public. Well, and I, I, I know some people were confused when I, I said, you know, we're going to do the art galleries, the art centers as the second topic on COVID. And, I, I, you know, some people were sort of saying, what? Why, are you, why are you doing that? But I, I mean, I, I believe, you know, as somebody who, who knows each of you and, and your centers, and there's there's many more across Canada that we have a really... Uh, unique and rich, you know, Ukrainian Canadian arts uh, sector, right? The the visual arts, uh, in particular, that your that your center showcase. So I think it sounds to me like like there's a, a lot of uh, some great projects that might stay on into the future in terms of how to how people can access some of your programming, how people can access some of your of your collections, and uh, and it sounds like your audiences are growing. In, in, in unexpected ways, which is always good to hear. So we're, we're getting close to 8.30, so we're not gonna keep people for too long. We do have a nice uh, audience on Facebook, so we're gonna shout out to them. Uh, thanks for joining us as well. And there'll be lots of people who will watch this uh, over the week as well. So the second question that we ask our guests on the COVID conversations is just you know thinking about what you've talked about in terms of how you've adapted. Um, how are you looking at, at the fall, right? How are you looking at the fall, at the winter? We've kind of gone through two seasons, I guess, spring, summer. Uh, now we're looking at the fall and, and potentially a year ahead or more in terms of what, what you read about vaccines and getting back to what you know, things might have been or things may not go back to what they might have been. Uh, so I wanted to start with, again, with Deb, then we'll go to Hannah, then with Pan Olich. Uh, how is your organization sort of thinking about that? And of course, there's different provincial rules in, in each of the three provinces where you are, uh, and, and they change from time to time depending on the health situation as well. So, Deb, what's Aqua thinking about in terms of the, what the fall and into the winter looks like for you? Um, so we're we're trying to, um, I guess, basically we're going to try to get back to as normal as possible. And with that, what will happen is is that the um, our board of directors, which is a, a extremely dedicated board of directors, and they've certainly shown that through and their commitment to Aqua through all of this is everybody got to work, rolled up their sleeves and made things happen. And so um, each board of each member of our board chairs one or two different committees. And, you know, so they were tasked to to give the consideration and the thoughtful consideration and the planning to move forward with each of their different departments that were programming. So, like I said, we're, we're, we're hoping to go back to business as close to usual as possible um, with some ab adaptations. And like I said, with the expansion of the space, that will allow us to, to bring back a lot of our programming, but yet do it um, with the proper social distancing. Um, like uh, in Winnipeg, we opened, our galleries opened in phase one, and we were able to um, open in May to the public. But of course, there were a lot of rules and restrictions around that. So it was a very good trial for us because um, we were very fortunate to have the Larissa Sambaluk Chaladin's exhibit, Embroidered Memories. 
And so that was um, uh, set up for exhibit and that was, we held that through the month of July, uh, June in our new space. So it was a wonderful opportunity, not only to host um, that exhibit, um, but also to tweak um, life during COVID. So, you know, there was, there was a lot of learning for us in, um, you know, mass and protocol and booking appointments to view exhibits and how do you mark out the spaces on your floor and allow people to go through that. And while it might seem simple, there are a lot of logistics to all of that. And then how do you advertise it and promote it so that people feel safe coming back? Because uh, we found once we opened the doors, um, people are still hesitant to come back. So the programming that we're looking at running. And so, like I said, Embroidered Memories was a blessing for us because it allowed us that opportunity to work through that. Um, so for the fall, we're kicking off with a harvest market, a large harvest market, um, which will um, all proper social distancing and we will have it outside also to allow the space that we need. Um, we're allowed to have live music again in Alberta, so so that will be a part of it. And this is just a, you know, it's a welcome back party, right? And we're hoping that by then, you know, people will be able to, schools are supposed to reopen. A lot of people are going back to work. It's also a way for us to introduce some new vendors. Our gallery and boutique committee has been actively looking uh, to increase our number of vendors. We're starting workshops again and workshop programming. And again, it's putting, it's working out all those logistics to make sure that it's, you know, people feel safe, they feel comfortable. It's all, um, you know, COVID, COVID friendly, right? Um, yeah, and we hope every day it changes and every day the numbers change and, you know, you can plan. And we, we've taken a little bit of a different approach in that we, we plan often a year at a time or six months at a time. We do a lot of work. Um, in those big chunks and now we're we're looking at things in a little bit smaller picture so that if something has to be changed or um, we have to adapt something or we have to postpone something then it's not such a such a massive undertaking right. as it was right. um, we don't have a lot of time but we were planning to hold an international textiles conference which was scheduled right i remember hearing about that in may um, you know we had significant funding in place and you know, uh, two years of planning had gone into this, and um, it was uh, it, it it was big, and we were really looking forward to this five day event. So of course, that was one of the huge pieces that we were really hit with, is that we weren't able to have that conference. Um, you know, I would like to shout out to that textiles conference committee for all of the work that they did in rethinking it, and we are restructuring it, and we've met with our funding bodies provincially and federally. Um, and municipally who are funding this program, you know, we had to get our new plan approved, but instead we are going to do it over a year. So okay. instead of one big weekend, we've broken it into pieces and every month starting in February, we'll host another piece of that conference. And it's going to be a combination of in-person, um, online, interactive with Ukraine, um, there, you know, there'll be a whole gamut of different pieces, um, you know, some internet uh, projects too to go with it. Great. So that we'll keep, it, yeah, keep us posted on that. I think that'll be something that I think even with these online things that, that people might be, uh, people from across Canada might be able to access some of your programming in a way that yeah. they weren't uh, yeah. before. That's what we're we finding. We want to do a one weekend event. Yeah. Um, that's a lot of commitment you're asking people for. So we're going to spread that out over. And Great. then again, if every month something changes, yeah. easier to adapt it, then can't postpone a five day conference. Okay. Well, we'll keep people posted on that. And Hannah, I'd also say that, like, what's the, what's the thinking like for your fall and, and winter? Um, yeah, so we're, of course, we're trying to plan ahead, but of course, also thinking about, uh, anything can happen really. So, keeping the focus on online content. Um, we've really enjoyed connecting with maybe people we wouldn't usually be able to connect with, like artists and academics, um, not from Winnipeg, but from Alberta. We had two Alberta lectures uh, that we were able to have on our YouTube channel and all of our social media. Um, so keep keeping looking forward to that. Um, yeah, hosting different people that we wouldn't usually get the opportunity to. And it's a great way because of course we're all finding ourselves, especially arts 
in a crunch for money. I mean, the online content is free. Uh, it's something we can do and we're promoting each other, which is really great. Um, we are supposed to have our AGM in June, but we postponed it to September. So that'll actually be our first, technically our first event that's in person at Osiraduk, although we'll be offering it on Zoom as well. So it's September 16th. So we want to try and include as many members as possible. And then hopefully getting back to workshops and lectures and just in discussing that, it's going to be more about um, maybe doing the same workshop twice or three times and having a limited number of regist registries and just letting people, um, we'll have to offer it more than once because we still want people to enjoy it, but we'll just have to maybe keep the numbers down in each workshop so that we're able to um, adhere to those social distancing protocols. And then just like Deb said, we're trying to get new vendors in our boutique, uh, take this time to, you know, just really connect with more people. Um, I think that's like one thing we're finding is that this time has given us more time to connect with more people. It seems like we're distanced, but at the same time, not so much. Excellent. Well said. And upon the Oleg, what, what's Kumpf, uh, Kumpf thinking about in terms of the, the fall and the winter? Well, uh, on the board of directors, we have very hardworking and uh, devoted people that do not lose optimism <laughs> in this hard time. And uh, we built uh, a five-year plan for our foundation, for our gallery. We're looking forward for that, starting from this fall. And uh, usually, it's, uh, mid of September is uh, the opening of the fall um, uh, um, um, session of our fall um, season. And uh, it's supposed to be something unusual, something creative that uh, attracts more people. Usually we have uh, more than 100, 150 people uh, during the opening of that uh, time. Uh, of course, it will change uh, uh, of the circumstances that we have now. But um, we are planning a very uh, interesting show, which uh, we are looking forward to be uh, very unusual, very, uh, it's a, uh, it's a, uh, the exhibition um, runs by Kerry Parna from Winnipeg. Uh, it calls uh, Pause and Plight, which originally is supposed to be opened in Osiradok in May, but unfortunately it wasn't, and uh, it will probably be later there. Mm -hmm. But we started uh, from Eastern Canada with that show. Uh, this exhibition is uh, commemorating the internment, uh, 100th anniversary of internment of Ukrainians in Canada this tragic uh, page of uh, Canadian history. We never had so much information about that. Uh, even the Museum of Human Rights in Winnipeg, which I attended, uh, didn't have that information about this, uh, this period uh, for three years of internment. And uh, very unfortunate and very tragic. And uh, uh, with this exhibition, which is supported by the uh, World, world, world first uh, inter recognition fund, internal recognition fund, and the uh, Chichenko Foundation. And uh, this, uh, we are looking forward to, to present this show at the, um, some educational, not only um, um, to show beautiful art of the uh, artist from Winnipeg, which uh, is very incredible, very professional artist, Kerry uh, Parno. But also we want to, um, to uh, attract uh, groups of uh, students, invite groups of students from the schools, from senior homes to, to show this information, not only to, um, to, uh, to the art that uh, reflects, it's uh, artist's reflection of that, uh, of that page of Canadian history, but also we want, would like to, to inform about that, uh, which is probably the first time in Toronto that we can present this uh, in that way of uh, the picture. We also have some other exhibitions for the fall um, that will be in October. We plan an exhibition of uh, 45th anniversary. So it will be probably from the Kumpf uh, Foundation uh, collection and maybe some of the members uh, collections. So we are, we are looking for that. And also we have annual shows, the Ukrainian Association of Visual Arts of Canada, which is very uh, interesting, very innovative show, and every year it, it attracts also a lot of people. Of course, everything will have impact on our attendance. We have to be 
again, creative in this situation. We're already preparing the, the gallery to that. Um, uh, we cannot even expect what, what would be uh, the um, attendance and what, uh, how people will react to that. But we hope that everybody will come back to, to the gallery and uh, we'll come back to normal life again. We do. So, and I, it, it does sound like, like uh, each of you are, are doing incredible things. And so we want to, I want to thank you for what you're doing. And again, you, you have great teams that you're working with. Um, we had one person sort of write a question, which is sort of about the digital versions of your collections and where they can learn more. So uh, we'll just go with Oleg and Hannah and Deb. Oleg, what's the, I know you're on Facebook. Kumf is on Facebook. Is there a website that you wanted to share with our guests? Yes, we have a website called uh, com. Okay. Uh, you can see some of the, our collection there. But also, as I mentioned, we are digitizing um, best of the best uh, uh, for the... We have all collections uh, in uh, files, of course, but we mm -hmm. want to, to create something new to, uh, to uh, have a look on what kind of work we have. Beautiful, incredible uh, collection. And also, we would like to even uh, for the 50th anniversary, maybe to public uh, to publish uh, a catalog uh, of the best right. work. So it's it's a long process and it requires a lot of uh, funds for that, of course. But we started already this summer uh, to digitize, and uh, we hope that okay. uh, very soon we'll have some presentation that uh, we can show to our uh, members and to our followers and to our uh, art flowers. Excellent. And Hannah, if we want to learn more about Osiradok, what's your website or, or Facebook address? Uh, so osiradok.ca. And so we do have some items from our collection featured on our website, like some uh, highlighted ones. Um, we don't have a digitalized collection yet. That is something that we're working on. We want to work towards. Um, but what we do try and do is that myself and the museum technician Olenka often go and look for something that's interesting and relevant to people now or try and make it relevant. And we're always trying to post something um, from our collection on our Facebook and Instagram. So although it's not a digital version, we're still trying to share it in the best way that we can and then kind of giving some background info on it and how it kind of relates to us today and making it relevant to our lives. Yeah, those have been very interesting. And Deb, uh, in terms of Aqua uh, online, where can people learn more? Um, on our website, A-C-U-A-R-T-S dot uh, C-A. Um, we're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. So any one of those locations, and that's where we post our exhibits. They'll be posting. Uh, we don't have a collection. We're not a, you know, we're, we, we don't have a museum as such, uh, but definitely our exhibits and just going for a virtual tour of the store, which features, you know, the hundreds of pieces of original art is well worth a person's time or visiting our online store. Okay, excellent. Well, I wanted to say a huge thank you again to all of you. Uh, thank you to our partners at the Red Cross and Government of Canada for facilitating this conversation. Uh, it's been a good good conversation and I think an interesting one. And we'll, we'll check in with you, I think, in the fall and in the winter in terms of how it's going and, and what the shows will be. And uh, UCC does a weekly COVID-19 weekly update as well as a monthly bulletin. So we, we will be happy to feature any kind of the innovative online uh, events that you're, you're offering as part of our sort of information sharing. Uh, on August 12th, we'll be back with our next community conversation on Ukrainian festivals, which of course uh, have all been canceled in their traditional format, but there's been some really interesting, uh, innovative things happening to continue to engage with our community. So we'll learn more about that. I think we have Ottawa, Toronto, uh, Edmonton, and Dauphin, I think we will have. So four festivals to tell us more about that. And we're going to have uh, further conversations about long-term care, seniors, and education as we go throughout the summer and into the fall, because it's already almost August, which is hard to believe. So once again, thank you to each of you uh, for the work that you're doing. And we will uh, continue to be in touch and we'll share uh, this video uh, on, on our Facebook so that you guys can share it with your folks as well. Can I sneak in the last word? Sure, absolutely. Uh, and behalf on, uh, um, you know, on behalf of all of us, uh, thank you UCC for taking this initiative to make this happen. 
Um, I hope that, you know, um, thank you for recognizing this because all of our organizations, be it the arts or uh, whatever they, you know, all of the groups, this kind of exposure and support is invaluable. So thank you for highlighting us and thank you for taking You're this. Welcome. This is one of those things we always wanted to do, but never had an opportunity to there do. You go. <laughs> Here we are. <laughs> okay. Next time we will meet the all without online. Just <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And I have to bring lots of money to buy things at all of your boutiques. Absolutely. And absolutely. I'm a dangerous so we shopper. Take, um, we run a tab. We take check. We take <laughs> cash. <laughs> you seen me at work in your boutique. I, I'm lethal. Okay. Well, dobrani sim, uh, diakuyu, and uh, have a nice rest of your evening. Take care.